Hello. So, welcome to Naval History Live. Welcome to my top 10 ships. Now, hopefully by now, you know who I am. I'm Alex Clark. And today I've been set a challenge by one of the great people who I chat with on Twitter. Their name is engaging strategy on Twitter, and I'm going to respect that and keep to that as well as that's their handle. But the task they set me was top 10 ships, which were not any of the four classes which I am known for spouting on about. So that's tribal, battle, daring, or town classes, specifically the daring 1949 class. They're the subjects of my book, so I get enough time to talk about them in my book, so it is a fair assessment. But that's a little bit limiting, but it's also quite a lot of fun. And I do realize I've been doing very heavy on the serious side lately, very heavy on the very in-depth and long talky side of naval history. And as much as I enjoy that, I do also enjoy, as Bill Trump testifies to, current events, and I do enjoy the lighter side. So, without much further ado, and with some... Props at the ready, an introduction to my top 10 ships. I suppose that meant, yeah, right. Yeah. <sighs> Keep worrying about the BN button. Sorry, the criteria. How well did they fit their nations in the period they were built? Um... I said, no point comparing HMS Victory to a Type 45. And also, the interesting point here is that they were built. So I'm not getting into Tillman battleships, anyone. As cute and as lovely as they are, and as much as I would love the thought of 19 inches of belt armor wandering around the world, I'm not getting into Tillman battleships. And how good do they look is going to be a factor. Their critical stats. And the AC factor, because as I'm honest, I don't like the Bismarck. I just don't. I don't think it's, a, it's just not a design I like. Sorry. <laughs> I will talk about it. I will quite happily discuss it and be fair on its you know, performance and operations, but just don't like it. And the important thing is, it's my top 10 list. But I am going to be interested, especially in the discussion later, in hearing about your top 10 lists and, you know, comparing and chatting about ships and having a really good, hopefully, geek out session about ships because that's part of why I do all this YouTube stuff because I love having geek out sessions about ships. Right, next one. So, some notables here. Um, there's HMAS Australia. There's HMS War Sprite. There's USS Texas. There is HMS Leander 1848. And there is, of course, Dunkirk. All these ships are lovely. They're all wonderful. They're not really what I'm going to make into my top 10, though. But they certainly would be in the top 30. Possibly even the top 25. There's Dunkirk there, though. That could be 26. Mm, it could also be 24. It depends on where I put Scharnhorst. Anyway, so it's top ten today. Okay, it's top ten. So I'm gonna I'm restricted myself to top ten. The first slideshow might well have been forty five slides long, but I'm restricting myself to the top ten. Okay. So this is going to be a quick video. It's top ten. Just remind me of that today. So, number 10, HMS Meteor, an M-Class destroyer. Now, actually, I've always quite liked the M-Class. I know I don't do anything really about them, and there are many, many reasons I don't. But mostly it's because, honestly, 
when you do stuff about an M class destroy, you have to get into the differences of the 4.7 inch guns versus the other 4.7 inch guns, and it just becomes complicated. But these are pretty cool 4.7 inch guns. Uh, they actually weigh in more than a uh, their in class destroy at 1,920. 1,950 tons standard, so that's about 100 tons more than a tribal class destroyer. And the M class were originally going to be, you know, there's all sorts of debates, but they're ordered in 1939, so they're ordered literally on the brink of war, and they enter service in mostly our sort of service in 1942, 1941-42, when it's the war is really going on, and you know, there's been so much fighting, there's been so much going on. But they look cool. They do look cool. They are pretty looking ships. And even with their oversized goggly ass style 4.7 inch guns. And I do understand what I'm saying here. But, the, you know, if you consider all the other ship uh, this guns, you know, the, the, the way the turrets mount them, the guns are quite close together. These ones, the guns are as far apart as they can be. They look sort of, it, it, it looks like some sort of tractor you know, fork that lifts things up, and they are really, really good guns. So, yeah, HMS Meteor. She's cool. Plus, that's the coolest name of the M-Class. I, I, I'm i so annoyed I was on an HMS Mars. But, you know, HMS Meteor was cool, but there should have been a Mars class, an M-Class destroyer, but there wasn't. It's just terrible. But, she's pretty. Next one, number nine. USS Spearfish. Okay. I realize I don't talk about submarines that often, and you could get the idea that I don't like subs or I'm not keen on them. I actually really do like subs. It's just when I'm talking about presence operations or when I'm talking about... Most of the stuff which we need to learn about, i.e. peacetime navy, because wartime navy is quite well covered often, but I do enjoy that, of course. But peacetime navy is often fairly well ignored. Submarines really don't have much bearing. Um, it's kind of strange. Peacetime navy, a submarine's job is to train for war and keep tabs on the enemy, intelligence operations and supporting special op forces. That's what they do. Wartime, they turn into sea denial tools par excellence. They're basically mobile minefields that you go, I'm going to put this sub there, and you're either going to have to sink it, or you're going to lose a lot of ships to try and get through there. So your jobs are sink it or avoid it. That's literally your options when you're facing off a submarine. And Spearfish is one of my favourites. You know, I just love the fact she does so many tours. I have her listed up here, I have it listed on the system, and she, I've got her listed as doing 12 war patrols, and that's just, that's a lot in the Pacific, you know, she does, she's basically in the World War II from the get-go, she is, does her first patrol in 19, let's see, I think she's commissioned 1939, I think, though, she doesn't really do her first war patrol until 1941. But she does, she fights the whole way through the war, and she's... Oh, oh of course, I'm not fired too much on, because America's not getting involved in war till 41. But, um, you know, she does it pretty much straight off. Uh, she's operating in the war from the Americans for the straight off and the whole way through. And she does, she's this little ship. And she has so many people crowned the board her. It's just, you know, when you think about these ships, they're, they're less than 100 metres long. They're less than 9 metres wide. So think about that. Um, if you've got, your average car is about 2 metres wide, okay? And, the, uh, you know, um, pickup truck usually a little bit wider. You're talking a roughly 4 cars wide. And you're going to cram a crew in there of, well, let's see, crews, I think the, the crew's got to be about, yeah, the crew is 60, five, 50, five officers and 54 are listed, it's technically 59, but I think it's usually about 60, I don't think they always had uh, the minimum numbers aboard, and they sometimes had other things. 
There's just so much crammed in there. You have huge diesel engines. You have all sorts of torpedoes. It's just it's all crammed in there. And I know, being a patriotic Brit, I should have a British submarine in here at this point, probably. But um, no, I have Spearfish. She's cute. Hang on. It skipped on to Dragon. And I didn't even realise. Well. Eh? That's Spearfish done. And B. You know who's next. HMS Dragon. Now, I like the Type 45s. They look mean. And pretty. I especially like HMS Dragon. Because she has a dragon on her. And I just think that's cool. And honestly, let's... People who go to uh, the amount of times I've had people turn around to me and tell me go, oh that spoils her camouflage. It's eight freaking thousand plus tons of warship, which is mostly painted grey and stealthed up. So by the point at which you see her, it doesn't matter if she has a red dragon on her bow or not. You would see her. She's not exactly going to disappear in sight. So, you know, in either way, you could paint the entire thing pink. It really wouldn't matter that much. Unless you're talking about making it visible, more visible to satellites. And I don't think that red dragon is going to make her more visible to satellites. It might well allow better identification of which Type 45 you're dealing with, which is an issue in wartime sometimes, perhaps. But honestly... If you're operating far enough on the sea, it doesn't matter. And they're cute. The reason, though, it doesn't come high enough, that it's number eight, is because it's so much of the stuff is fitted for, not with. I would love them to have been fitted with their Mark 41 VLS. I would love them to have the Tomahawk land attack capability. I would love them to have SM3 anti-ballistic missile capability. Don't I'll keep the Sea Viper system for the air defense. Because, frankly, the Sea Viper is a... <whistles> SM6 is good. I will not tell you it's not. But the Sea Viper is... It's good. And believe it or not, you can have a world. The world is open enough for new enough units that you can have two good air defense systems. And honestly, I think the British turning up the Sea Viper is a good thing. Because... That means, you know, it's far more difficult to predict British, uh, Western air defense systems when other people turn up with the S standard missile system. So PAMS is good. But no. HMS Dragon. She looks good. And that's not just in that photo. She does look good. Plus, I've been on Type 45s. They are lovely to walk around. I mean, they have space. Fairly comfortable, though, compared to some as well. Right then, and it's next one. HMS Conqueror. I thought it was going to be a British sub here. And let's be honest, this is the sub. This is the. I think it's the um, nuclear submarine which got the terror of making the first ever nuclear submarine ship kill. Officially. There are probably some various fishermen and various other ships around the world which might not agree with that one but HMS Conqueror sinks to Belgrano and I know I am sorry for the people who died and the crew lost in the Belgrano and them losing their ship but I also think it makes HMS Conqueror pretty darn cool and the fact that she is in a museum ship is something which is, I'm going to have to be complaining about. I realise we have to wait for the reactor and all sorts of things to be sorted out and all these things, yes. But I also think she should be made a museum ship. She is going to be cool. She is cool. And... There she is. So... By my calculations, we're on to number six, which is HMS Folkestone, the smallest shipper in my top ten. And I just think she's cute. She's a sloop with a four-inch gun. She goes into Sing Tao in January 1939 with HMS Birmingham, and she still points her gun at the Japanese heavy cruisers. Oh. You know, seriously. 
that's just the sh- it's a crew on a ship which just screams gumption and her entire experience of war is pretty cool she, you know she is commissioned a uh, launched in 1930 commissions in 1930 and she spent she actually you know rescues people in world war 2 she does all sorts of operations of world war 2 on the a- a- escorts of convoys and all sorts of things um she's just a little ship that could and she does she does a lot of things she is forgotten though in some respects and i wish she wasn't i think she needs to be more remembered which is one reason why i bring her up so often that and she's cute right then number five so we're entering the top five now i think I, sorry, I will admit this now. I keep hitting the M button rather than the N button. That's on me. HMS Warrior. <laughs> oh, she's pretty. She really is pretty. And I like her because she is, to me, really when the ironclad age comes of age. Yes, she still has masts. Yeah, they're not trusting the steam engines, but she is beautiful. And if you get a chance to go aboard her, go aboard her. There's just so much in her, which is so well thought out. The people have been spending a lot of thought and a lot of care with designing her and how they lay her out and how they organize her. But also, as a museum ship now, there is so much well thought out in her. She is certainly pretty. And what I would add is someone who has taken students around her, the museum staff are incredibly accommodating. But you know, you think about her, her time, she was you know, she was Launched in 1860 and commissioned in 1861. And there's always the theory that she's commissioned to fight the French, that she is, you know, some sort of thing that, you know, the French produced the gloire, and so the British respond with warrior. But I think really she is the British responding to the world at this time. The British are. The global navy and they can't afford to be the ones who are behind anyone so they aren't they take the lead again they go yeah you can build that but look what we can build it's better it's prettier and it actually works so often that happens oh, well. yay uss winston s churchill okay so, right, I really like Arleigh Burke Destroyers. I have a soft spot in my heart for them, despite my thinking that they are overly crude and cramped in some regards. And I think you could honestly, if you applied West uh, European-style sort of crew management and labour-saving systems, you could get that ship a lot more space for the individual crewmen. Um, I'm not surprised with the design they've picked for their frigate replacement. But I like the flight two A's. I especially like Winston S. Churchill. I like their design. I like their structure. I like the fact that they have a nice, well balanced armament. I think they are destroyers, though. And they are very good destroyers. So the reason she ranks in at this position, number four, is because as good as she is, as pretty as she is, She's a destroyer, and you're going for a, The Americans have gone for a one size fits all navy. And I think you need cruisers for the larger statement when you're doing diplomacy. And I think you need frigates for the anti submarine and, new, and number mission, i.e., providing the numbers of fleet hull units you need. And I think 
by trying to standardize on Ali Burks, they've taken it possibly too far. But saying that, she is pretty. She's named for Winston at Churchill. And she is very, very potent. They are very, very useful ships. Anyway, for number three, I need a prop. Yeah. I feel the need, the need for speed. <laughs> yeah, it's Enterprise, which of course had Top Gun fit and they had filmed on it and all sorts of other things. Um, she's just pretty. She's also the first big nuclear carrier, and honestly, you can't say anything better than her. Um, she stands up at her time, and she is this big, world-beating ship. And yes, you have to look at the progeny who come after her, the Nimitz class, and now the Four class. And you have to say, what went wrong? Honestly, what went wrong? Enterprise has such a vision, such a power, such a presence, such a statement. And... Ever since, they've almost been trying to build them on a budget. And every time they blow the budget. They just don't have the same romanticism for me. Um, Enterprise, you could have, honestly, if I'd been a United States Senator, you could have told me that she cost a hundred billion dollars a year to run, and I'd probably gone, yeah, we'll keep her running. Because she just has this about her. A character. And that's why she's in my top three. Plus Top Gun. I'm an 80s kid. What do you expect? Braden. HMS Victory. I'm British. But notice she hasn't made it number one. And she hasn't made it number one for a reason. At the moment, she's currently without her full mass. And frankly, that just decapitates her. She looks so pretty when she has her masks. And she's so powerful. But she's this sort of symbol, and she, you know, victory is often just associated with one battle. She does dozens of battles, you know, skirmishes and all sorts of things over her career. She's involved in oh, so, so much. She has such a long career. And she's so important. She is, she is the spirit of just not just a navy, but a nation in many respects. And I'm not going to cry because I'm I'm British, but um, yeah. Victory special. That she is. She's so special. <sighs> right, number one. Loophole. <laughs> you the the rule was, no tribal, no battle, no daring. Nineteen forty nine. And no town class. No one said no HMS Unicorn. And frankly, she is pretty. And she's not an aircraft carrier. Remember that? She's a forward fleet aviation support ship. She's not an aircraft carrier. So you are not Mr. Uh, Mr. Defen uh, you know, Defense uh, in Committee for... In what is it? Com Committee for Imperial Defense? Committee for... There's, the committee names change so often at this point. Um, uh, but basically, Mr. Pr uh, Mr. Member of Parliament, this is not an aircraft carrier. You're not funding an aircraft carrier. Mr. Treaty Enforcer, this is not an aircraft carrier. We're forward aviation support ship. Forward aviation support ship. Model, of course, for the light fleet aircraft carriers. She is, in many ways, the ship which is most important of Henderson's designs. Because she forms a base of light fleet carriers. She comes into service at a critical time in the war to provide the light carrier support. And also to provide eventually the forward aviation support in her original sort of cover role. And she is the sort of trendsetter and design. And if you think about all the fleets that depended on in the 1950s, 60s and 70s 
on light fleet carriers. Well, British design light fleet carriers for the aviation, for their aircraft carrier. They all owe it to her. So she is in many ways the mother of many, many nations' naval aviation capabilities. That would probably make Admiral Henderson, who is her father, who is the person who pushes for her to be built, their grandfather. So, you know, so, uh, he, he deserves a lot of world as originals. <laughs> but no, you really thought it was going to be anything other than an Admiral Henderson construction as my number one? Really? Really? <laughs> no, she is pretty. Right, so that is my top 10. And I will discuss them more this afternoon, but I'll also be looking forward to hearing about your top 10s and discussing them with you. And who knows, I might even manage to get some pictures to work, although that probably will be on the pr uh, thanks to the printer rather than uh, the system, because um, as good as everything is working when it's recording, Live? I'm not sure it would work. I'm not sure. But anyway, thank you very much. Take care and see you this afternoon. Please do remember to subscribe. Please, thank you to my patrons. Thank you to all the people who have subscribed. Thank you to all the people who share this. And thank you to all the people who are, I don't know, just watching. Hope you enjoyed. And I look forward to hearing about your top ten.